Our topic this morning is hymns to hum make you hem go hmm. Think about that. Did you just sing those words? Or did you really mean it? Okay, now Bethany, now that you're all the way in the back, you have to come all the way back because we're going to sing This Is My Father's World. Now the test question. What are those verses talking about? Those stanzas talking about? Yes. How creation praises God. How creation praises God? Okay. Another thought. Yes. How God is evident in creation. Okay. What else? Come on. This is the interactive part of chapel. Yes. God is with us always. How God is with us always. Okay. Yes. Um, how God speaks to us. How God speaks to us. Look at that last line. He speaks to me where? Everywhere. As we look at... Um, God's word this morning and we look at it as this this part of the song as a jumping off point. I want to talk about and I want to focus on how God speaks to us everywhere. Now, there's something that should be implied in that. <coughs> Let me ask the question a different way. <coughs> what is the number one rule of ensemble playing? Well, okay, there's, maybe it's the second rule. What's, what's one? Play together. Play together? Okay. Um, are you in pain yet, Mr. Raleigh? What's the number one rule when you're an ensemble and someone's conducting? Relieve Mr. Raleigh of his pain. What are you supposed to do? Uh, huh? Yes, watch the conductor, pay attention to the conductor. Okay, are you a little bit more relieved, Mr. Raleigh? I, I feel your pain. If I was in your shoes, it's like, oh, come on. How many times do I have to say, okay, that's the number one rule. What's the number two rule? I think what the number two rule is. And please, don't cause Mr. Raleigh any more pain this morning. Yes. Listen, listen right? So you're supposed to listen to Mr. Raleigh sing while he's conducting, yes? <laughs> yes? <laughs> yes, David. Play in tune. Play in tune, which there's a, a companion part of that. What is that? An ensemble for a great blend. What? Playing in rhythm. Playing in rhythm, but it has to do with listening. Listening, Katie. Listen to everyone. Yes, listen to everyone else. Listen to everyone else. That is so critical. Other than following the conductor and paying attention to him, the next thing that Mr. Raleigh and any conductor wants is, yeah, we're assuming you play in tune, okay, but listen to those around you so that you become one in a blend. <coughs> Is that easy? Does it require work? Yeah, it does. I want us to look at a portion of scripture in um, First Kings because I have a suspicion, having been at camp for a number of years, how many of the, how many of you have been here? This is your second week. Raise your hand. 
Okay, are you as full of energy and just ready to get up in the morning and just go, go, go like you were on Monday morning of the first week? Okay, Brian, but Brian's weird, right? Okay. I suspect that a lot of you are kind of tired. Uh, how many of you that have been here for two weeks are going home at the end of this week? Oh, no. Are you going home because you're tired? No. You, okay. You know, it's interesting. Um, I've been around Shay long enough that when people get tired, when it's hot, they don't get a good night's sleep, or they stay up and talk until two in the morning. Not that, not that any of the guys would do that. The girls are the only ones that do that, right? The guys don't stay up, right? Yeah, right. I have two sons, I know better. But you kind of get cranky and tired, and there's a certain thing that kicks in. I've noticed that certain students at Che love drama. And the more tired they get, the more drama there is, right? And in fact, through the years, I've found a couple of students who live for drama. In fact, if they weren't headed in some other career field, they could be professional drama majors. Okay? I have a friend, and uh, I'll offer this to the nurse for what it's worth. I have a friend whose spiritual gift is not mercy, and when she encounters drama majors, she says, wah, 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 call me a wambulance. Okay? And I think that's kind of funny because I don't have a, the gift of mercy either. Mrs. Pinkham does. But there's something to be said, if we really admit it, for just a good old-fashioned pity party, isn't there? Just something that appeals to our sin nature. And it just, we just feel great. Okay? If you're honest, at some point, especially if you're really tired, at some point in your life, you've just enjoyed a pity party. I want us to go to 1 Kings 19. And I want us to look at someone who is having a pity party. 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 1. It is page 520 in my Bible, if that helps at all. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. What's the backstory to this? Fill me in. Fill everybody in in case somebody doesn't know. What's the backstory to this? What went on before this? Yes. Um, Elijah, there was a long drought and then sin. Okay, long drought. And Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal and another god to like a down, whoever they would. Okay, Elijah challenged a bunch of prophets. I think there was, what, 850 of them, if I remember correctly, or, okay, to a showdown, a confrontation between the God of Baal and the true and living God, okay? And whoever, they would have sacrifices and whoever's God is entire from heaven would be the winner. And uh, God sent uh, the Baal, the false prophets, God sent that many, the God is sent fire from heaven. And then they um, killed all the prophets were killed. Okay, good. So in this confrontation, the Baal prophets called down fire and nothing happened. They cut themselves, screamed and jumped up and down. They had a lot of drama all day long. Nothing happened. Elijah says, okay, Lord, let's do this. And boom, they were gone. The sacrifice was gone. And as a result, he killed, I think it was 850 people. Okay, so right after that, this is the setting. Verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I don't make your life as a life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. What's strange about that verse? Anything strike you strange about that verse? He just seen the power of God. Yeah. He just seen the power of God. And, yet, and what was interesting is there's tons of people all around him. 850 prophets of Baal. And now just one person is threatening his life. Here's today's freebie. Okay, kind of take a bunny trail. 
Many times when God carries us through a great victory in our life or we experience God on a whole new level, Satan is right there ready to pounce. He knows where our weaknesses are and he wants to get us down off of that spiritual high as fast as he can and try and destroy us. God's word says he's a roaring lion trying to eat up anybody in his path. Tuck that away, those of you who are going home at the end of this week. Because if you're feeling really close to the Lord and you've had some victories in your walk these last two weeks, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, as soon as you hit home, somehow, some way, and it may be a whole lot more subtle than this, God's, or Satan's going to try and attack you and knock you off. Be alert. But, verse 4, Elijah himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It's enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I'm not better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came <clears throat> again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Interesting, isn't it? He was thoroughly exhausted. I suspect some of you are going to head home. You're going to conk out on the drive home, right? And when you, when you go to get up in the next morning, uh, it'll probably be, well, it'll be Sunday. But maybe Monday morning you'll probably get up around uh, 1 or 2. You're just going to be totally exhausted from camp. Okay, God understands that. He gave Elijah a time to recoup physically. Give yourself time to recoup physically. If you don't, it just gives Satan an opportunity to just get in there and just knock you down. Verse 9, cave and lodge there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, Oh, I've been zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. This guy, come on, cut me a break, God. I did what you wanted me. I, I stood up to all these people. Cut me some slack, for the sons of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, torn down thy altars, and killed thy prophets with a sword. That's true. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Is that true? Those of you that know this story, was that a true statement? The first part was true. Is the second part true? How do you know it wasn't true? You, no, no, I'm talking Miss Cohen. You were shaking your head. No, it wasn't true. Or were you just like trying to clear the fog out? Um, it's because um, God was with him. Okay, God was with him, but there's something else that is blatantly in your face that is not true. Yes. He is not the only one left. Yeah. The Lord. So were there like three or four more? There were, I think it, over here it says seven. Verse 18. Look at verse 18. Was he the only one left, or were there just three or four more? How many were left? 7,000. 7,000. Okay. Is 7,000 just a couple people? No, God, God made a point so that we understood. He wasn't, Elijah wasn't alone, but he feels like he's alone. When we're tired and we're having a pity party, that's exactly what happens is we want to, we isolate ourselves. God doesn't intend that to happen. Verse 11. Go forth, God said, and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And a great strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. <coughs> but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire and after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. Do you get the picture? Here he is. He's in this cave. And this huge storm comes through. 
it was a huge storm because the mountain, pieces of the mountain were literally breaking off in the wind. Any of you ever been in a windstorm where you cannot stand up? A couple of you. I was born in Alaska and most people think, well, you know, they would close school because of the snow in Alaska. That's not true. Where we lived in Palmer, Alaska, they closed school more often because the wind was so strong you couldn't stand up. If you went out to your bus stop, you didn't. You got blown down the road. That's how hard the winds were. Okay, but as hard as that is, these winds were worse. They were actually tearing pieces of the mountain apart. And there was an earthquake. We had earthquakes and tremors when I was in Alaska. It's kind of scary when the whole ground moves underneath of you. But this was pretty violent. And whatever it caused it, there were major fires afterwards. So here's Elijah, he has this great victory, he's tired, he gets nourished, he gets rest. God says, okay, go here and listen for me. And all this stuff is happening around him. And scripture makes a point in verse 12. After the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. And it came about when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave and behold, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Does that sound familiar? What are you doing here? What's Elijah say? Then he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, torn down thine altars, and killed thy prophets with a sword. And I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He was deep in the midst of a pity party. God was trying to tell him something, and he wasn't listening. He was having his pity party. Now here's verse 15. Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazael king over Aram. Wait a minute. If I was in Elijah's shoes, I'd be saying, well, wait, didn't you hear me the first time? Didn't you hear me the second time? I've had it rough. Isn't it interesting that God didn't even respond to his complaints? He just said, okay, I got something else for you to do. I had something else for you to do. Young people, when you go home this weekend and, and you crash in one way or another and Satan attacks, the tendency is going to be to try and suck it in and maybe have a bit of a pity party or just stay put. I really miss my friends at Che. I really miss Che. That's great and that's valid. But God has something for you to do outside of Che. Life is going to be moving on. He intends for what you've gone through these last couple weeks for you to build on that and trust him. Too often I'm afraid that this is what we're looking for. Okay, God, I had a great time at Che. I really feel close to you. That's wonderful. Now, just blow me away with something fantastic in my life. And he might do that. But more often than not, when I look at scripture, I see a God who isn't blowing people away who are drawn close to him. He's talking to them quietly. Now, guys, I have an experiment. I have a couple minutes. When your parents talk to you, do you respond really well when they yell at you? And they say, look, I want you to take out the garbage. <laughs> Doesn't it make you just love your parents and want to do anything they say? <laughs> <laughs> or if your parents say, Woody, could you really do me a favor? Could you take out the garbage? I, I know that's your chore and you probably forgot because you got busy with stuff. But could you just take out the garbage for me? Which would you rather respond to? 
Number two. Number two. I think that's true of most of us. Okay, now our par we know our parents would never yell at the girls, right? They never yell at the girls. It's only the guys. That's our burden, right? As guys. They yell at us. They don't yell at the girls. Okay, but do you realize that God as our Heavenly Father operates the same way? And when we say, God, show me something big. Show me something big. Blow me away. We're in effect saying, God, yell at me. Now, sometimes God has had to yell at me when I've been in rebellion against him, but more, than, more often than not, I grow when I listen to God's quiet voice. You know, Dr. Shu was like that. Let me ask you a question. Anybody ever hear Dr. Shu yell at someone? Anybody? Randy, you've known him how many years? 35. Have you ever known Dr. Shu to yell at someone? No, never. Mr. Raleigh, how about you? Any of you students know Dr. Shu to yell at you? Some of you had him as a piano student. Did he yell at you, Stephen? Did he yell at you? Well, he wouldn't yell at me directly as in, like, I'm doing something wrong. He would yell more as in, like, if he ever did yell, he would yell for, like, happiness. Okay. Okay, that's more rejoicing. The, the Bible talks about the angels rejoicing in heaven. So that's a great exclama exclam exclamation. Oh, irregardless, Nancy. Okay. But I've never known Dr. Shu to yell or to scream. I think he modeled for us our Heavenly Father. I really do. Pop over to Psalm 46.10. Psalm 46.10, be still. Can you listen when you're running around, as my mother used to say, when you're running around like a chicken with his head cut off? Some of you don't know that, what that image means, but I do. Can you, can you be still and listen when you are running around like crazy? When you've got your cell phone on one ear and your iPod on the other and your notepad in front of you and you're talking to three of your friends? Do you think you can hear God speaking to you? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. You know, the NAS version translates be still as cease striving. Cease striving. So my question for you this morning is, what, how are you living? Are you living in a constant state of anxiety or drama? Are you struggling? I don't understand who I am. I'm having a hard time <laughs> trusting the Lord. He loves us too much to scream over the noise in our lives. He loves us so much, he will wait patiently for us to calm down and listen to him. Young people, listen to him. Now, Bethany, if you'll come up, and Randy, I'd like us to turn to 517. I was looking at this hymn last night. I'd like us all to stand, because I want this to be our closing prayer. So 517, stand, but I want to make this comment. Hymns to hum and make you go, hmm. Please, please do not sing this hymn if you do not mean what it says. Please keep your mouth closed and take your mind and say, God, what am I missing? What am I not hearing that you're saying? If you mean what these words say, then sing it as a closing prayer. And Randy, I'm going to push the time. Can we do all of the verses? <laughs>